exactly a year ago since the Westgate Mall attack in Kenya, and we recount how the media covered the uh, sudden death of uh, Professor Kofi Awono, who was in Nairobi at that time. Professor Kofi Awono was former chair of the Council of State. Uh, he was killed in uh, the shooting incident at the shopping mall in Nairobi. Professor Awono died from gunshot wounds to the stomach during an attack on the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi by a Somali militant group Al-Shabaab. He was in Nairobi as a guest speaker for a conference. Professor Awuno left his hotel with a son who drove him to the mall to have breakfast together when the fatal incident took care. Ghana's High Commission in Kenya has confirmed that Professor Awuno's uh, untimely passing and well, it was an indicator that his son, who also sustained injuries in the attack, survived. Uh, well, he survived his dad. He came home, you recall, uh, to uh, the funeral organized here in Ghana. He was a father, a friend, a mentor. A teacher. You know, he was definitely, uh, he was definitely one of my very best friends. Um, you know, what most people don't know about him is that he was a very fun-loving person, very humorous. We used to, you know, play pranks on each other, and it was just whenever we were together, it was just a laugh and a blast. My dad was a tough disciplinarian, and part of it is also that I was a good girl, and my brothers, the ones right after me, were rascals. So they got a lot of discipline, but we all agreed at his 75th birthday that his tough hand was good for us because we all turned out okay. He called me his personal assistant, uh, the chief of staff for the family. So <laughs> you know, uh, we we're close. Anybody who had any form of relationship with my dad, who, who learn something, you know, gain something from him. And it was evident when he passed, you know, there so many people, people I didn't even know, came up to me and were telling me stories of things they learned from him, you know, how close they, they were affected by what happened and everything. So he touched a lot of lives. So I actually love this earth, my brother, so much that I have a, an epigraph from the novel at the beginning of my own novel. So um, he was a huge influence in my life, even though he was absent physically for me or in my memory until I met him again in Nairobi. The one thing that he always made sure we did, after any new experience, we had to write a, a book report. On it. We had to write a report, an essay on what we did and the experience. And, you know, so me being, and he remarked, it just, you know, as, you know I'm nine years old and he was marking my essays as like, I was a university student. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely helped uh, shape who I've become now because uh, it's, it's made me a good, very, very good writer. When you start to to face life, let me put it that way, you know, then you, you kind of appreciate um, the people around you. You know, um, you, you kind of understand what each person is worth. You know, it was literally from that point on, I. I started getting an understanding of who my father was. It was later in the years when we, I started, you know, assisting him. Then I, I became, I, I started to gain a deeper understanding of the kind of person my father was. My father was a very um, plain and open book type of person. You, you know, you didn't. Um, What you saw was what you got, and he was very direct. He spoke his mind. And so I, I guess with anybody, with anybody, there is probably a very private side to each and every one of us, which none of us know, but all of us suspect. Yeah, secondary school, I actually did literature. So I studied um, the cathedral, the journal one, and then I did literature as an elective course, so I studied other poems from other writers as well. Uh, funny enough, in secondary school, I kind of understood the poems, but in, I never really read my dad's book or his works, simply because I didn't understand it. <laughs> I just thought, Charlie, it's, it's my being complicated. <laughs> but 
you know, later on, later on, especially now, as soon as like as he passed, as I went back, I started. I've been reading his books, and I've I kind of easily get a clear cut visual understanding of what he's saying now. It's almost as if he's talking to my ear. You know, it's it's weird, but you know. A lot of things. All right, uh, we'll bring you that sound bite later. So uh, we remind ourselves what Good Luck Journalism of Nigeria said. But now, let's find out. We, as reporters who covered this uh, f from Ghana, from here in Ghana, Martha Akwa, Crystal Akwa, is assignment editor here at Joy News, and she's with, she's here with me in the studio. Uh, it's, it's good to have you here. Thank you. What was it like for you? I, I remember I was on the air, but you you were in the back. You organized a lot of the things that mm. happened. What, what was it like for you hearing the attack in the first place? I think when the news broke first, we were just taking it as another terrorism attack mm -hmm. on the international communities, not really Ghana. Then the whole focus changed when we got information that one of the renowned sons of the land was involved somehow and he's lost mm. his life. Initially we heard the son and then the father both died in the shootout. Mm -hmm. Then later we got to know it was just Professor Uno who was dead. So the focus changed. Now we have to cover it like one of our own is dead mm -hmm. not in ghana but outside ghana so how are we going to do it we have to plan how we're going to do it so we make it very relevant to what is happening on the international community so we have to start planning on what we're going to do on the home front so we started with a trip to the volta region to his hometown yeah. chairman of the council mm -hmm. of state but beyond that what kind of man was mm -hmm. he so now we needed to locate people who can give us the information we didn't have. So all that went into playing, planning mm. how we're going to cover this whole mm. um, incident. Mm. Con considering uh, the Accra Mall here in Ghana is one yes. of the biggest hangouts mm -hmm. here, and hearing that this attack was yeah. a, a similar mall mm -hmm. in Kenya. You, as a, a journalist, was it so easy for you covering and talking about this and having people go here and go there? I remember at that time, one of the stories we did was to go to the Accra Mall and find out how this incident was going to change security arrangements at the Accra Mall. So we went there and then we realized that people were shopping as usual. They didn't care because if someone was going to attack the Accra Mall, the person wasn't going to give prior notice mm -hmm. like it happened in the Westgate um, case. case. So, why would people stop shopping anyway because there's something happening in Kenya? So when the authorities at Accra Mall were saying oh, they are putting extra security, which we knew wasn't going to change anything, anything. because nobody is going to prompt you that I'm coming today, I'm coming tomorrow. I guess after a few days when the issue started dying down, mm. they also moved on with their life as if it never happened. Mm. But we did that one and it was people felt we were hyping it too much and mm. were putting fear in people because we should carry our stories and allow people to also go about their normal duties go out there have fun shop and do everything so why should we go to a cramo and ask if it was the next point of attack mm. then we covered the funeral itself itself yes. the arrival of uh, the remains mm -hmm. of kofi mm -hmm. awono uh, sh share, share that coverage with us the coverage at that time was <laughs> it was difficult mm. because we had time that the body was going to arrive. We made every arrangement and we ensured that we had all the people we needed to talk to on um, the beat. People who are going to give us the information we need, run commentary for us and everything. This was prior arrangement we made. Now on the day when it was time for the remains to touch down, unfortunately one of our technologies failed us. Mm -hmm. So we have to find other means of getting the information to our cherished viewers because they still sit by waiting for us to give them the information. So we have to use other technology. I remember when we didn't get the live um, footage, we needed to use um, WhatsApp mm. from the beginning to get pictures from the airport so that we can at least tell them we are there. 
we are working on the technology that is failing. And I remember there was only one cameraman because they were not allowed. At a point, they didn't allow more than two people from a media house to go beyond a certain point. Mm. So it was only the camera. They had a choice to choose between a cameraman going and then the reporter going. It's, it's TV, of course. We want mm. the video. So the cameraman went, and he was all by himself carrying this technology tele and TVU behind him, doing all the work without any direction from anyone. So the video he was taking was the only source of information for us because mm -hmm. there was no journalist beside him to even run commentary. Mm -hmm. So that was how it all started, and we started calling him. Mm -hmm. We realized, no, it wasn't going to help him to call him. Let's just leave him and allow him to flow mm -hmm. and give us as much as he can get. Then perhaps after that one, when he's able to meet up with his reporter, we can do more. Mm -hmm. Mm. I, I, I remember that uh, at the time of the attack and, and the um, uh, issues that followed, a lot of concerns were raised for, uh, about public places here mm -hmm. in Ghana, especially mm -hmm. with the you know, increasing number of attacks in Nigeria, Ghana's relationship with Nigeria and, and, and the likes. One year down the line, you, you covered that story. We, saw, we brought uh, some live pictures. Has Ghana learned any lesson as far as public safety is concerned? I won't say Ghana has learned any lesson because, you know, we have our own laws, which um, sometimes we flout with impunity, like having fire safety, exit points, all those things at public places, because you, are, you have built a place that is containing more than your household. Even if it's your household, when there is an emergency, evacuating people will be difficult. Now, I know that there's supposed to be a fire certificate at all these places, indicating they have been inspected mm -hmm. by the Ghana National Fire Service. But most of these places don't have it. The exit points are too small to contain people who are panicking to run out safely. So we don't learn lessons when things don't happen to us. I guess we are waiting, we are all waiting for something like that to happen to us, then we crack the whip. Who is supposed to go around and ensure that people have the fire certificate? It's supposed to be displayed. I remember talking to a fire service person who told me that if you are entering a place, a public place like that, mm. make sure you see the fire certificate before you enter. How That's many going of to be us very even, difficult. Because it's supposed <laughs> to be displayed at the entrance. Mm -hmm. So when you are entering, you know that I'm entering a secured building. But it's not displayed there. So you go in there, whatever will happen will happen before a committee and a commission and investigation will start and we go nowhere from there. Then what? Well, uh, we'll find out that answer in subsequent broadcast. Then what? Thank you very much, Martha, for oh. joining me here. Martha Krensolakwa is assignment editor here at Joy News. I'll be back. Shortly. Don't